Yeah, thank you so much for the warm welcome, Inesh. And I've got to say, secret to pitching a PhD is to have really supportive advisors. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I'm cognizant that we have a kind of a, a wide and mixed audience today. And so my talk today is actually going to reflect that. It, it, to, so many of you, many of the trained eye might even look like two separate talks trying to be condensed into one. And so the first portion, I'll try to give a little bit more of a high level overview of where it is that kind of I see across the space machine learning being um, impactfully applied to climate action. And then the second part will be a bit of a deep dive into my own group's research focused specifically on this idea of how do we develop machine learning methods for optimization and control in electric power grids. Um, so I'm in to part one, tackling climate change with machine learning. So the premise of this, which I think is not alien to, to people in this room, is that climate change is a big deal. We're already experiencing effects from storms to droughts to fires to flooding, and these impacts are being felt globally with disproportionate effects on the world's most disadvantaged populations. In order to kind of avoid some of the worst impacts of climate change, we as a society need to rapidly reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere, for example, hit net zero by uh, CO2 emissions by 2050. And this requires a rapid transformation across virtually every sector of society, from energy to transport to buildings to agriculture and so forth. In addition, we need large scale efforts to actually adapt to the effects of climate change that we're going to face. And this requires efforts that are inherently local in some sense, different places will face different effects. And so the kind of strategies to actually deal with those effects will look a little different, but at a global scale where kind of adapt adaptation efforts are needed everywhere. And so given that it might become natural to ask, well, a lot of people are talking about AI and machine learning these days. Um, how does that fit into this picture of, of needing to act on climate change? And, um, you know, uh, uh, several years ago, a, a group of researchers came together to, to try to ask this question and answer it a little more systematically. Where is it that machine learning can be used for climate action? Um, and so that kind of result was this paper, Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning, which for those of you who are interested in this broader space of machine learning climate change, I'd encourage you to check out. Um, and in that work, we looked at different ways that machine learning could be used to address climate change across sectors. So mentioned sectors like energy, transport, buildings, climate science, and so forth. Um, and while I won't be able to go through kind of all of the specific applications that we saw um, during that time, what I do want to do is go through a set of maybe kind of cross-cutting themes that emerged as we examined applications across these areas as maybe an opportunity to give an indicative sense of what are the kinds of ways that machine learning can potentially help um, and hopefully kind of, you know, seed some further thought among people in this room, right, who, who may be working on different sets of challenges about how these different kinds of approaches may or may not apply to, to the work that you are doing. So a first major theme is distilling raw data into actionable information. Hmm. So there are many situations where having targeted on the ground information would help us make better decisions. So where exactly are greenhouse gas emissions coming from and at the entity level who is emitting them? Or where is deforestation happening so that we can actually better um, address actually trying to prevent deforestation? Or what are the energy efficiency characteristics of buildings or what types of crops are in different types of land across the world and what is the yield of those crops and how will that change with climate change? Ideally, what we would have is actual targeted on the ground data where we've done extensive on the ground surveying efforts in order to get that information. But sometimes that's costly or not feasible due to capacity reasons. And so in those situations, one powerful technique can be to leverage kind of broader, more general raw streams of data like satellite imagery, like aerial imagery that we may have access to and use that to try to identify who is emitting, what do the buildings look like, where is deforestation happening and so forth. And the basic idea in all of these applications is you get some amount of satellite imagery, you hand label some amount of it to say, okay, these are the energy efficiency characteristics of this set of buildings and so forth. You train a machine learning model to kind of learn the patterns that relate what is in the satellite imagery to the label of what is there a building here or not that you specified. And you try to scale that model, basically apply it to global satellite imagery to see if you can identify that same pattern in other places. The image on the slide is an example of one initiative that's doing this. It's an initiative called Climate Trace, which is a coalition of 
nonprofit or organizations, which are basically trying to come up with an independent um, inventory of greenhouse gas emissions um, around the world at the entity level. So then what, which specific entities are emitting how much and when in order to provide an independent input and estimate to the um, UN climate negotiations, given that different countries and different entities maybe have incentives to not necessarily always honestly report on their emissions. Is there a way that can use satellite imagery and other sources of open data to actually independently derive these estimates and publish both the inventories themselves and the methods behind them? So this is one example of kind of taking raw information and distilling it into actionable insights. Another similar theme is the theme of forecasting. So for instance, when we're managing power grids with large amounts of renewables, um, or in general, we need to maintain an exact balance between electricity supply and demand at every point in time. And this can be really challenging, both because electricity demand can vary based on things like, I could decide to walk over there and turn off the lights right now, right? And I didn't have to pre-register that action but also because we're starting to incorporate more time varying sources of energy like, uh, like solar power, wind power into the power grid, whose output varies based on the weather. And so there have been a lot of efforts to try to come up with more targeted predictions of things like how much solar and wind power we might have. And the general approach here is that we want to combine a combination of historical information. So things like how much solar power was produced in the past with potentially some amount of real-time information. So how is how are clouds moving overhead and how might that affect actually how much solar power production I have? And one kind of strength of machine learning is the ability to take in kind of different types of data, we would say different modalities of data and learn powerful relationships between them in a way that allows us to kind of figure out patterns and apply them in this case, figure out what tells us how much solar power is gonna be produced and actually apply that in real time. And so the image on the slide is from a nonprofit called Open Climate Fix, which is basically doing exactly this. They are combining together historical solar power uh, related data um, there uh, along with the predictions, uh, weather predictions that are coming from numerical weather prediction models. So physics based models alongside satellite and aerial imagery that are indicating something about how clouds are moving overhead and combining all of those together using a machine learning model to learn patterns in order to improve predictions. And um, in their work with the UK power system operator, they've reported being able to actually have the error of the forecast compared to what was there before. Well, both of the prior sets of examples have to do with a situation where a machine learning model is providing insight to a decision maker who will ultimately then go make a decision there are also kind of particular sets of cases where machine learning may be used for actual automated decision making and kind of optimizing or controlling the system. So a common way this comes up is in the control of heating and cooling systems in buildings, where there are huge opportunities for efficiency gain. Some estimate as much as even you know, thirty percent of kind of energy usage from heating and cooling systems can be reduced via smarter control strategies. Um, and how this basically works is that you want to kind of combine a bunch of different information. So for example, um, information from sensors telling you how kind of hot or cold a building is right now, occupied, what's the weather outside, what are, what are some characteristics of your building. And by combining that information together, again, kind of you can learn patterns in that information that allow you to figure out how to best control your heating and cooling system in a way that maybe maintain some notion of, say, thermal comfort, you want to make sure you're not too hot or cold, but maybe reduces the amount of energy input that's necessary in order to actually do that. Um, and this theme of kind of controlling um, heating and cooling systems or otherwise automatically optimizing systems comes up not just in heating and cooling systems in buildings, but also things like cooling systems in data centers or industrial refrigerators or the optimization of power grids. A related but maybe kind of unglamorous um, uh, set of applications is in predictive maintenance. So trying to identify either in real time or a little bit ahead of time, um, potential inefficiencies or faults that may occur in infrastructure so that you can actually deal with those as quickly as possible and ensure that your equipment is running as efficiently as possible. The image on this slide, for example, is from the German rail operator Deutsche Bahn, um, which 
uses machine learning to detect potential faults in the switching infrastructure on the, the rails and in order to then figure out, okay, is there something I need to do in order to kind of fix those and keep the trains running on time? Now, uh, for those who may be from Europe, you might tell me, oh, Priya, but the German trains are not super timely. Um, and the answer is maybe it would be even worse without machine learning. Um, another kind of related application is um, methane leak detection. So as um, natural gas is um, transported from where it's extracted to where it's used, it kind of passes along a network of lines and compressor stations and um, may leak out from these as methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so there have been some efforts to try to identify based on satellite and aerial imagery, as well as potentially even sensors outfitted along this equipment, where is something weird? Where is there maybe some anomaly or some kind of place where I can see a natural gas leak? Um, and can I actually address that in real time? And of course, with all of these things come questions of incentives. Is your kind of natural gas operator actually incentivized to do something about the thing you're pointing out? And so in all of these cases, of course, machine learning is only one part of a broader solution, but in this case, it could potentially help with the detection piece. Well, all of the previous applications I've talked about so far have to do with, in some sense, operating or, or working in a, an existing system. There are also various ways that AI and machine learning are being used to help accelerate the discovery of kind of future technologies or next generation technologies that we may to, to actually transform the system. So um, the image on the slide actually came out of Stanford in 2020, this, this paper, um, and it was using um, machine learning to try to accelerate the process of discovering batteries. The idea being that if you try to synthesize a battery, it takes you know, time to do that. You might need to cycle the battery for many months to understand how it actually performs. And then after that, you might try to synthesize your next battery, see how it performs and so forth. And so every individual design cycle for how you're actually synthesizing a battery takes a lot of time. And so you really wanna make sure each of those counts. And so there have been places where machine learning has been used to do things like analyze the outcomes of past experiments to synthesize a battery and suggest which experiments to try next in order to speed up the overall process of getting to that better battery. And um, you know, there are some kind of industry numbers that are not necessarily methodology disclosed here, but in some cases, there at least have been some reported numbers that there have been 10 to 20 times speed ups and that kind of, the, or uh, 10 to 20 time improvements in the number of design cycles that are necessary to actually get to that better battery. In the same way that AI and machine learning can help with kind of, um, accelerated science, there are other ways that it can help with kind of the um, improvement of models in science and engineering. So there are lots of places where you have some kind of model that you need to run to tell you something about the future. So a climate model to tell you what will the climate look like in the future. Um, in energy, we have, for example, ca uh, capacity expansion planning models that try to tell you how will I build out my system in the future in kind of, um, uh, urban design and city design, you might actually have physical models that are modeling how kind of wind flows through urban spaces in order to understand actually how you build the city in the first place. And in all of these cases, these models involve writing down a large set of scientific or physical equations and solving. And that process can unfortunately be really computationally intensive and slow in a way that means if you're trying to assess different scenarios of what could happen in the future. So for example, um, you know, what are kind of different ways that my climate could play out based on different assumptions of how we're going to emit? Um, that's hard to do because each scenario is so expensive to run. And then also you actually don't tend to get a lot of um, spatial resolution on these. A lot of our um, kind of climate models, for example, are providing you one data point for what's gonna happen over the entirety of New York state. But if you're trying to do something like formulate a disaster response policy or figure out where you should site your wind turbine based on future wind patterns, you're really looking at a much tinier resolution than that. And so AI and machine learning are used in a couple of ways here, one of which is to try to actually speed up or approximate all or parts of these models by basically treating a component of a model as something with inputs and outputs and then trying to use a machine learning model to approximate the relationship between those inputs and outputs. That's the image on the slide, which is basically um, a paper that provides a 
benchmark data set for approximating the physics of clouds in climate models, where any individual cloud might be very expensive to model, but you can maybe kind of try to use a machine learning model to approximate the relationship between the, between the inputs and outputs of a cloud model and then run that component more cheaply in a way that allows the overall model to run faster. Um, and another kind of common use is something called downscaling. The idea that you have a model output that might be very coarse resolution, um, but you might have on the ground data, like if I have a climate projection that's at a very um, large resolution, and I kind of project that backwards and say, what would my climate model have said in history? And I have very granular on the ground weather data historically, I could learn the relationship between what my climate model says happened and what my weather data says happened. And then kind of use that to say, if I have a future climate projection, I can apply that same relationship to understand some estimate of what more granular weather would look like. Last but not least, um, while machine learning models kind of, you know, rely on data, so you often think of data as an input to a machine learning model. There are situations where machine learning models can actually help us with the process of managing and creating data so with a bunch of caveats that sometimes using machine learning models can be like a game of telephone. You put some data in, you get something out, you give that data, which might be slightly erroneous to another model, you get something out. So with those caveats, there are still some, some really powerful ways that uh, machine learning is being used for, for data. Um, one effort not pictured on the slide is um, from a group called the Catalyst Cooperative, um, which is based in Colorado. And what they do is they take um, different federal um, electricity data sources and try to figure out automatic ways to manage them. The issue is basically that if you have particular power generators um, that you want to understand something about their behavior, some data about them, like um, their actual operating characteristics um, might be in one data set, and another data set might contain information about, for example, how much energy they were producing or the emissions associated with that. And the labels for the same power generator in these two different data sets might not be the same. So it might not be as obvious as figuring out, okay, these two rows are the two rows that have to be merged. And so they're using machine learning to help identify can we automatically detect which sets of rows might actually correspond to the same entity, for example, by looking at the specific labels that are used to um, identify the entities and see if there are any systematic patterns and kind of how labels are generated in one data set versus another, even things like, can I identify some similarities between the actual data in each of the rows in a way that allows me to automatically merge? And they're doing that to kind of provide better data for policy and, and advocacy. Another uh, uh, kind of option uh, pictured on the slide is to actually use existing data to generate kind of synthetic data in situations where for some reason the real data is not kind of usable. So the image on the slide is trying to use for, it is from a paper that basically says, I want to generate um, scenarios for how wind power production will look in the future. And all I have of course is data about how wind power production has looked in the past. And so what they do is they fit a machine learning model to this past wind power um, production data. They basically get some probability distribution. They use some of their own knowledge to say, we expect that wind power generation will get more extreme in this way or that way. So they kind of tweak the probability distribution. And then they draw more samples from that probability distribution to kind of generate potential future scenarios for wind power production. Another example not shown on the slide is uh, the kind of um, generation of potentially um, uh, synthetic data sets for electricity usage in homes, where there are certain entities that have access to really large um, public data sets, or sorry, large but private data sets about how people are consuming electricity and can't make those available for research purposes because there's privacy related issues with doing that. And so there's some initial explorations to think about, um, for example, um, can we actually use a machine learning model to learn something about what that data looks like and kind of generate synthetic data that ideally has some notion of looking like looking like real smart meter data, but also preserves privacy and, and release that. And this work is still in its initial stages um, or kind of in its evaluation stages to make sure that 
you still preserve the fidelity and privacy of the underlying data, but it's, it's something. This is a different class of problems, but certainly data centers use a lot of energy and are right? people in your orbit thinking about making AI less computationally intensive or Absolutely. And actually, let me uh, hold on that question for two slides, but yes. Um, okay. So one point I'd like to make is that the types of machine learning that are used across these different settings are extremely diverse. I think when we hear about machine learning in the news today, we often are hearing about kind of large language models, foundation models, generative models. These are all kind of buzzwords people might have heard of. And these are useful in certain settings, but they do make a specific set of assumptions. For example, that you have a really large set of data, you have access to a lot of computational power to the extent that even large academic institutions are complaining, we don't have enough compute to compete with what some companies are actually creating here. Um, assumptions like data is all you need. If you have kind of existing knowledge about a particular situation or scenario that you don't need to care about that, you can just learn that directly from data um, and specific metrics of performance. things like the average accuracy of my output is what I care about. And in reality, when you look at climate related settings and a lot of different settings on the ground, there, there are some important differences. Sometimes you have less data or you actually might have a lot of data, but it might be hard to move around. This happens on the power grid where you actually have sensors that are collecting a ton of data, but you have communication constraints. You might not actually want to store all of that data all the time, right? There are implications to actually having, storing, collecting large amounts of data, and it might not always be worth doing that. You also may be in situations where you have access to less compute because of kind of your own infrastructural or monetary constraints or because you're trying to implement machine learning on a smartphone or on a control device on a power grid, which is kind of small. And of course, and I'll get to this more, there's a huge imperative to reduce the energy use and emissions associated with these models, which means figure is not always better from a societal perspective. In many cases, you do have useful knowledge about the particular area that you you care about. So on a power grid, we know something about the physics of the power grid. You don't have to relearn that from data. And so kind of thinking about where is there this marriage between what you need to learn from data and what you already know um, can have actually huge benefits in terms of computational efficiency, data efficiency, and performance. And then kind of how we evaluate our models and as a result, how we should build the models in the first place varies across different settings. In settings that are, for example, um, where you're doing some kind of prediction to understand how to best represent or enable an underrepresented population, you might not care about average accuracy across all data points. You might care more specifically about how your model is doing on a specific subpopulation of the data. Or if you're someone like me who works in power grids, safety and robustness of your model are more important than kind of raw performance in many settings. And I've listed a bunch of other metrics on the slide like around privacy and interpretability and uncertainty quantification and so forth. But we care about different axes of performance and the kinds of models that you use or develop care about those different axes of performance. It's I also, before I kind of close out this kind of over UV portion of, of machine learning for climate change, um, I focused a lot on kind of the ways that machine learning can help address climate action. And I really do think there are a lot of very cool and powerful opportunities to leverage this toolkit in places where it makes sense to accelerate our efforts here. Um, but machine learning's relationship with climate change overall is much more multifaceted. And so it affects kind of the work we should be doing and what it kind of the ways in which we think about organizational policy, um, governmental policy and so forth in this realm. So I kind of came up with, with one of the questions, you know, machine learning itself has um, impacts through the computation it runs. So when you run a computation, you're consuming electricity, you might be using water to clear your data center, for example, um, and the hardware on which those computations run. There's emissions associated with producing and transporting that hardware. There disposal related issues, there are materials that go into creating that. And while some of the macro level numbers here in, in principle have not been huge in the past, so in kind of 2020, you might think of the entirety of the information and communication technology sector making up about 
one and a half percent of global greenhouse gas emissions and AI is some fraction of that. We are entering a realm where, of course, AI and machine learning models are being used more. The types of models that are being used are larger in a way that increases both the emissions associated with creating them and the emissions associated with each individual use. Um, and where greening the power grid and kind of powering those computations via renewables isn't a sufficient strategy in a world where carbonization of the energy sector and all of our scenarios to do that rely on efficiency and kind of you know, improvements in that regard. Um, and so there are efforts both at the micro and macro scale to, to address this. So things like um, figuring out ways to actually pr produce smaller machine learning models that have uh, reasonable amounts of performance, figuring out ways to prune existing large models um, to, to actually um, do that. Um, approaches like trying to schedule computations depending on what the emissions intensity of the power grid looks like and hardware related strategies like actually capping the maximum power that a GPU can actually reduce um, the, the total energy associated with that. Um, and if none of these strategies alone are sufficient, um, we do need to be thinking really deeply about you know, what types of AI do we wanna use and when, and when is it worth it and when is it not? Um, but um, I think that there, um, it is not an inevitability that machine learning will use a lot more energy. And so anyone who tries to tell you it's an, inevi an inevitability, particularly if they're a developer of machine learning, you should question that and sort of ask, there are levers that you can take to address this kind of what are you doing in this, in this respect. The kind of picture around the relationship between machine learning and climate change often stops at the two boxes I kind of previously had, and I guess now currently have on the slide. So, um, you know, is machine learning good for climate because it's helping to address climate change related uh, problems, or is it bad for the climate because of its direct hardware and computational impacts? But the story is actually much more rounded out than, than that, even though these are the two aspects that are often focused on in popular discourse. One is that machine learning is very often used for applications that are kind of not great for climate action. So for example, companies that have entire um, arms that are dedicated to selling machine learning technologies to oil and gas companies to facilitate exploration and extraction, or uses of machine learning to accelerate um, kind of bovine agriculture in ways that kind of entrench um, the existing sort of emitting nature of bovine agriculture. And so when we talk about kind of this question of is machine learning good or bad for the climate or what does it mean to align the use of machine learning with climate action, it's really important to be asking questions more broadly about uses in addition to just questions about the, the direct footprint, both on the good and bad side. And more broadly, there are actually a lot of uses of machine learning that we may not immediately think of as climate relevant and yet have huge implications for the climate. So for example, autonomous vehicles, that kind of whole area of research is very much powered by machine learning technologies. Um, but autonomous vehicles themselves may be good or bad for climate action, depending on the particular path dependencies and um, rebound effects that they introduce in the transportation sector. If autonomous vehicles are developed in a way that kind of entrench the role of private or fossil fuel transit, that has a very big, a big and different implication than strategies that potentially facilitate connections between different modes of transit to facilitate public and multimodal transit or explicitly help be used to help um, uh, with kind of uh, uh, electric vehicle adoption. And so there are choices that we could be making in terms of how we actually move forward on these applications that affect their eventual climate impact, even for applications that we might not immediately think of as climate relevant. There are also a bunch of applications that fall into this category that have to do with things like um, the ways that machine learning affects how information spreads online and whether that's facilitating climate information by targeting information towards people who the most benefit for it from it, or, or whether it's facilitating climate misinformation because of the ways that um, like um, algorithms on the internet today will often prioritize things like um, engagement and clicks, which often correlates with kind of surfacing incendiary content. So there are lots of places where when we think about um, aligning the use of AI and machine learning with climate action, we want to be asking broader questions around for machine learning used in its business as usual sense, what does it mean to incorporate climate cognizant 
reporting and assessment, thinking both about the kind of direct computational impacts and the applications to make sure that we're overall trying to develop AI in a society that aligns with our actual goals and, and strategies for, for climate action. So that's the kind of um, close on the first part of the talk. Um, and the second part, I'm going to dive in a little more, do a bit of a technical deep dive on uh, some of my group's work on um, machine learning for power grid optimization. Um, but before I do that, I do want to pause and see if I maybe I'll invite like one or two questions. I'll also hopefully have some time for some at the end, but in case there are one or two questions on this part. Maybe the next part of the talk will show this, but I'm just curious, like from your from your opinion, like after seeing this space, like what are, you showed like a bunch of areas in the beginning, like which of them are you most excited about where you feel like you can kind of, even within this space, you think are really promising us, like promising avenues? Yeah, I mean, I think I might give a bit of a non-answer to that, which there are ones that I'm specifically obviously very excited about. I've chosen to work on them, like machine learning for power grid optimization. But um, I think that, in some sense, all, 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 all of the areas I, I am highlighted are ones that I am particularly excited about. And there's some I didn't highlight because I'm not excited about them. <laughs> um, and, but I think in all of these cases, it's important to get a sense of, again, like what does it mean for that particular application to actually be part of an end-to-end -end solution? So for example, there's a lot of work and it's very exciting in that kind of first category of um, analyzing satellite imagery to, to provide targeted insight. If that insight isn't provided to someone or it isn't insight that somebody actually needs, then that's not a climate solution, right? And so I think that in, in all of these cases, identifying where does that application sit within kind of a broader pathway to deployment or pathway to impact and ensuring that the application is developed in a way that facilitates that is important. And it means that the developers and owners of those applications may also vary, right? It might be more sensical for someone who, for example, is not sitting in a computer science department, but is said is sitting in kind of um, an energy systems department to be the one spearheading that work, whereas in other cases, it may, may be the other way around. Have to take a for question. All right, in that case, I'll move on. So for the second part of the talk, as I mentioned, I wanna uh, deep dive a little bit into um, ways that uh, my research group is thinking about machine learning for power grid optimization. Uh, I'm definitely not gonna get through all of these slides, so I might make some dynamic choices depending on how the time is going and, and hopefully leave a couple of minutes for questions at the end. Um, so power systems or you know, power delivery systems make up about a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions and have a really important role in helping us to decarbonize sectors like electricity transport or like transportation and buildings, given that our strategy is often to electrify a lot of those in the sense. And this is requiring a huge transformation on the power grid as we try to think about how to manage power grids at greater speed and scale and also integrate lower carbon resources, often time varying resources like solar and wind. But making these changes is challenging for a number of reasons. And one of these reasons is that power grids are inherently physical systems, which means if you change them, you need to make sure that they still work. And kind of the physics on power grids involve things like when you put power into the power grid, it's gonna flow along the lines of electrical equipment according to physical equations, and you need to make sure that you're not doing things like overloading your lines. You have various constraints on what you can ask your equipment to do. So for example, power generators have a, take a certain amount of time to turn on and off, or they have a minimum or maximum power generation that they can actually generate. Um, or there are various stability considerations where you have to keep certain electrical quantities like voltages close to kind of a nominal value and make sure that they're not deviating from that too aggressively. And layered on top of that are all sorts of decision-making processes that we're kind of instantiating all the time. So for example, how do I schedule electricity supply in the face of electricity demand, which may be changing, and in the face of all of these different constraints on the power grid that I need to reconcile. Traditionally, how this is done is through the use of optimization and control algorithms, where you basically would write down all the physical equations, all of the constraints that you care about explicitly, and then solve, solve a model in order to actually figure out what to do. And on the one hand, this is really, really cool 
because it means that if you write down a constraint that I care about, like please make sure that power is flowing on the grid or the, the, my, the way my model says that power is flowing on the grid is something that would actually happen. It means that you can say something about the fact that the output of your model corresponds to a scenario that's real that might not break the power grid and so forth. The challenge though, is that these models are really computationally intensive to solve. And in a world where we're having to solve decision-making problems on the power grid much faster to deal with things like high variability of renewables and at greater scale, as we start to see more kind of devices being installed on the power grid that we need to care about. So distributed devices, batteries, flexible loads, and so forth. These problems, we're not able to solve them fast enough to, to actually kind of deal with the kind of fast real-time decision of the power grid. And so that's caused kind of some community to say, okay, optimization too slow. Let's throw that at the door. Let's use machine learning. It's fast, it's scalable, great. And that is great, I think. Um, but um, one challenge is that machine learning methods, at least in their most naive form, don't tend to have any guarantees, period, but specifically with respect to actually satisfying physics and hard constraints on things like power grids. And so what my group thinks a lot about is how do you merge these two? How do you kind of keep the benefits of optimization and control and electrical engineering based approaches that are actually satisfying physical constraints on the power grid, but also how do you maybe leverage machine learning in a way that allows you to do this in, in a more fast and scalable way and kind of make decisions in a more fast and scalable way. And so the general approach that we take is an approach called optimization in the loop machine learning. And this is a framework for developing machine learning methods that incorporate knowledge of these physics or hard constraints or decision-making procedures we care about explicitly by writing them down as optimization problems and embedding those optimization problems into the construction of machine learning models. And so that might look something like this. You have a machine learning model um, that is kind of your standard you know, neural network, say, and I kind of decide that I want to somehow constrain what the neural network can output based <laughs> on some physical properties that I want to preserve in my power grid. I can kind of write down those physical properties, stick those into my machine learning model and make sure that my machine learning model is outputting something sensical. Similarly, there might be an objective function that my machine learning is trained to optimize. Um, kind of in general, a machine learning model is trained to kind of improve the quality of its outputs relative to a, a sort of described by some kind of objective function. Um, and I might want to embed some notion of physics or decision making within my objective function as well to make sure that the machine learning model can tell you to tell you. And so this is the kind of thing we do. I realize that all I've done on the slide right now is draw a box with another, in another box. Um, but um, kind of um, in this, this last part of the talk, what I want to tell you a bit is about how this works as well as depending on how much time we have, um, which we definitely won't get through all of this, but basically different ways um, that this paradigm of kind of embedding optimization and physical constraints into machine learning models can uh, play out. So what I will spend kind of time going through like appropriately slowly is this idea of how, how all of this works. And I will extremely quickly dash through the rest just to give a sense of how this paradigm works and we can kind of dive it through the Q&A or, or pull it afterwards as well. So the basic idea is that deep learning, while it may seem very scary, is differentiable function composition. So I'm gonna dive into what I mean. So on the slide is the depiction of a machine learning model. And this depiction generally goes something like you have some inputs that you're putting into a model and the model is producing some outputs. The model itself is a function with parameters and you want to adjust those parameters in some way. It sounds that the linear regression is an instantiation of machine learning, or I shouldn't put it that way in the sense that regression came, came first, but regression can be sort of viewed um, in this framework where you are picking some kind of functional form for your model. For example, it is linear. You have some parameters you want to learn, the coefficients of the, of the parameters, and the, the coefficients of your uh, terms in the model, and you're going to use some kind of approach to fit what those parameters should be. In machine learning approaches, this tends to be kind of an iterative process in that a model will kind of take in particular data, 
it will kind of have an initial guess for what those parameters look like. It'll generate some outputs, and those outputs will be evaluated on the basis of a quote unquote loss function, which can be thought of as a score for the quality of the output. And there's some mechanism based on which, depending on what the score is, you kind of iteratively update your parameters um, over time and kind of repeat this process over and over again until you decided that you're done. And so when people talk about deep learning, they're often looking at this general setting of machine learning, but where the specific model that they're thinking about is a neural network. And a neural network can basically be thought of as a bunch of functions that are composed together, that are strung together. Each of these individual functions tends to be a simple but nonlinear function. And kind of when, combi when you combine together a bunch of simple nonlinear functions, you end up getting in total a more complicated nonlinear function, which in principle is helping you to encapsulate many different relationships that could exist between your input and output data. And how this works, how the parameters are actually updated in a deep learning model are via a process called back propagation and gradient descent. The basic idea is that you kind of evaluate for your current instantiation of parameters and your current data, what the quality of your output is via this loss function. You take the derivative of that loss function with respect to all of the parameters in your model, and you use that derivative information to update the parameters, and then you kind of bring them over. And the upshot of that is that every single component in your neural network has to be differentiable. So I need to be able to take derivatives through it in addition to being able to sort of pass inputs into it and get outputs out of it. But that is not actually necessarily that hard, even though there are kind of standard sets of functions that people will use within neural networks that have this property of easily being able to map from inputs to outputs and being able to get derivatives of outputs with respect to inputs. If I decide that there's a specific function that I would like to see represented in a neural network that re represents, for example, how power flows on a power grid, or that represents something like a projection onto a set of safe actions in a control environment, I could potentially encode that in a way such that I can map between inputs and outputs, and I can figure out how to take derivatives of my outputs with respect to my inputs. And all of a sudden, I have the ability to embed that function within a neural network in a way that plays nicely with how neural networks. And basically this kind of simple observation ends up being really powerful in that it allows us to start embedding all sorts of kind of knowledge in the form of kind of optimization problems or differential equations or what have you into neural networks um, in a way that allows for things like improved performance or, or enforcement constraints that we care about. This general idea of kind of differentiating through optimization problems and embedding them into neural networks sits within a broader literature on something called implicit layers. And the key insight is that when you solve an optimization problem or a differential equation or something else like that, there's often some equation or set of equations that your solution satisfies. Um, so in the case of um, an optimization problem, when you solve it, there's kind of a set of equations called the KKT conditions of that optimization problem that is satisfied at the solution. Um, and you can basically use that set of equations at the solution as something you can take derivatives through in order to figure out what the derivative of your output with respect to it. So basically, depending on the set of equations you're looking at, you might need to adopt a slightly different kind of set of techniques to figure out what your derivative is. But once you do that, you can embed your function within a neural network. And there's been a lot of work looking at ways to embed, for example, quadratic programs. So quadratic optimization problems, neural networks, um, combinatorial optimization problems, satisfiability solvers, convex optimization problems, physics modules, differential equations, and so forth. And so the basic idea is that we actually really have this very powerful toolkit now for embedding all sorts of kind of knowledge from, from kind of different areas into the way that we actually design deep neural networks in the first place. And so for the really high level overview of how we actually use this in our own work, one application is thinking about um, how to actually construct reinforcement learning based controllers for um, kind of per se components like inverters or batteries on power grids. 
that are able to learn to do really powerful control strategies from data and from interactions with the simulation environment, where, but where embedded in them, we have put some notion of kind of control theoretic stability to make sure that the outputs are actually satisfying that. So kind of motivation slide about we want to merge between deep reinforcement learning and robust control, but how this actually works is that you might have something like a neural network, which is taking in information about the state of your control system, outputting a proposed action. And the proposed action is then projected onto a set of actions that we've derived from control theory as being safe. A projection can be formulated as op an optimization problem. I've sort of motivated that optimization problems are one of the things we can embed within neural network workflows. And it allows you to basically have a model, which is kind of a standard neural networky looking thing, plus a projection that allows you to train that model the standard way you would train a reinforcement learning model in machine learning, uh, uh, but still actually has provable guarantees associated with it out, its output that are inherited from control theory, given the way that we constructed that last layer of the neural network. And we kind of show that doing this thing where we are comparing against on a synthetic control setting, non-robust methods, robust methods, and our kind of combined methods, if you compare the performance of these different classes of methods in a kind of well behaving control environment versus one where you might have like kind of some adversarial noise or disturbance add to, added to the power grid that's trying to destabilize it, we kind of show that um, a traditional robust control method um, from control theory will be able to make sure that the grid doesn't go unstable in the face of adversarial disturbances but it might be very conservative and perform less well in the average case when nothing is going wrong. Whereas kind of combining reinforcement learning and control allows you to do the same thing of maintaining the stability of the grid, but actually improve your performance in the average case because you're able to learn patterns in the data. Um, and uh, yeah, and whereas kind of, kind of non-robust methods will perform way better in the average setting when nothing is going wrong but go completely unstable when something happens incorrectly on the grid. So that's one example of how you can think about using optimization and machine learning. Another example is um, the setting of decision cognizant prediction. Basically, there are lots of settings in which we're making predictions about things like what electricity demand will look like in the future. Um, but where not all mistakes are created equal. Under predicting electricity demand will cause me as someone who's scheduling power to make a very different decision than if I over predict electricity demand. And even though an under prediction and an over prediction might seem like symmetric first, the kind of effects of those are very asymmetric. And while there's, that's a simple example, there are lots of ways in which different types of mistakes in our predictions might lead to very different decisions in ways that are not always easy to encode in our kind of uh, objective functions for, for training our predictive models. And so what we basically look at is, are there ways that we can train machine learning models for prediction that are encoding information about the decisions that they'll be used for in order to kind of improve um, maybe overall decision-making process. So we look at this in the context of um, decision cognizant electricity demand forecasting, where we're trying to make predictions over the next 24 hours um, of, of electricity demand, but where instead of just optimizing for the accuracy of our predictions in some kind of decision agnostic sense, we ask ourselves, if we make a prediction, what will the decision be on the basis of that? So if I predict electricity demand, how is somebody actually gonna schedule power on the basis of that? And how good is that power schedule when it acts on the true electricity demand in the future? And basically that looks like a decision cognizant model where you have, again, a neural networky looking component that's taking in historical data, is predicting electricity demand in the future, where you kind of run that electricity demand prediction through a power system optimization model, which is again, kind of this differential optimization component, see what decision would be made and see what the kind of quality of that decision is when it acts on the true electricity demand that would get instantiated in the future. And the upshot is that, um, no, and the upshot of that is basically that um, if you kind of train predictive models in a decision agnostic way, 
you get models on the left plot that when you compare this red dashed line of a kind of standard accuracy optimizing model versus this green solid line of one that's explicitly taking the decision making context into account. Um, the left slide, left uh, image shows that the accuracy optimizing model is more accurate with respect to something like root squared error. But the decision cognizant model, by allowing itself to be slightly worse in some sense in an objective sense, when you look at the implications of the decisions that are based on that model on the kind of right side, that um, you actually can kind of enable the decision maker to avoid certain mistakes that are particularly costly from a decision making perspective. And in this particular, admittedly, right, like toy demonstration kind of setting, but kind of a kind of initial setting, we saw that this decision cognizant approach might improve um, decision costs by, by as much as 40% um, inish. I'm just wondering to what extent does the, the decisions that you make about the functionality of loss function um, lead to potential mistakes, right? So if, if you have a loss function that for a decision maker as a modeler is not working on the right things or not even including the right things, you may really um, decisions that you do use for all systems. Really dangerous, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So can you? Um, Absolutely. And so yeah, for those who can hear, the question was basically this idea that the way you write down the decision seems to be really, really important because if you write down the, the decision wrong, your model might might do something really bad. Um, and so there are a, a couple of things to to say um in response to that. So in this setting, kind of the output that we're producing is the forecasting model. Um, we're not necessarily suggesting that. Let's say that the decision that is output by by our model necessarily is like the the one to, to definitely take. Um, and so what you will often do is have something like a prediction with some notion of uncertainty. Your actual uh, decision making model should ideally also incorporate some notion of uncertainty that can potentially mitigate some of the like the types of misspecifications we know how to mitigate. But that doesn't fully answer the question, right? If we're completely wrong about how we're writing down the decision, then this is difficult. And I think what needs more kind of systematic study here is maybe like if you train a predictive model based just on accuracy and you train a decision making, a predictive model based on a particular decision, and you have an actual decision making setting that differs from both of those things, like what is the notion of similarity that makes sense here? So how do I understand, like it's possible the original accuracy optimizing model might've made the predictions that were really bad for my decision maker, or it might be that my new decision-making model is making predictions that are really bad. And I think there needs to be some additional study to understand like mm -hmm. basically how far off can your specification be while still maybe be better than having thought, thought about your decision specification at all. It's really hard to will emerge from the way in which we define the loss function. Yes, so this goes all the way to the example added that is going on the but yeah, can you define it in such a way that effectively the loss function is waiting upon the fact that the physical flow needs to be to a certain length and embedding optimization within the framework itself? Because the yeah, so it does lead to a higher computational time, but um, basically often in these settings, the trade-off you're making is um, there, there are two kind of buckets of computational time. One is how long does it take to actually train your model? And the other is how long does it take when you're using the model in real time? The di two diagrams I showed in these two different applications in some sense might look somewhat similar. It's like a neural network followed by kind of this gray, like expensive layer. And here it's the same thing. But the distinction is in this kind of control in the particular control application we looked at where the optimization layers in the model, it does mean that every time you use the model, you're running the optimization. And so that can be more expensive um, when you're actually running the model. Whereas in this kind of forecasting setting where we're putting the optimization in the objective, that objective is only showing up when you're training the model. But when you're using the model, you kind of don't have the objective function. You just have the kind of faster neural network. Um, and so it doesn't affect uh, 
slowly or quickly your model runs in real time. And so this is like a just a, a design trade-off that you can make basically like where does speed count and like how does that affect where I maybe the <laughs> Um, I know I'm kind of getting over time, so I'm going to give the one minute version of the kind of third application and then kind of for those who, who would like to stay, kind of open it up to some of the, the end questions. Um, but the third application we look at is this, this idea of there are extensive um, optimization problems that are solved to actually manage electric power grids. Can we actually approximate these optimization problems using machine learning methods that still have some feasibility uh, associated with them? And so we specifically look at this problem called AC power flow, where given some um, instantiation of electricity demand, we want to try to come up with a way that we're scheduling our controllable power generators in a way that minimizes costs and preserves things like power flowing through the grid in a sensical way that doesn't violate uh, the limits on the lines and preserving things like, I can't tell a generator to produce an amount of power that it couldn't actually produce in real life. This problem is, is slow to solve. And so what we basically do is say, we're gonna use a neural network to try to um, basically approximate the relationship between the inputs and outputs of this problem. So it takes in power demand and it outputs a power generation schedule. But we need to make sure that the solution is actually feasible. So what we do is we basically say, all right, we have some constraints in the original optimization problem that are gonna enforce that power will flow through the system in a sensible way. So we're gonna feed uh, our neural network output into this module that actually solves for how power would flow through the system and output that. And then we might kind of be asking a particular power generator to exceed how much power it could produce. We're gonna have some kind of model that module that corrects for this. And then we're gonna evaluate the quality of our overall solution based on a combination of the kind of power costs, which is the objective function of the AC optimal power flow problem, based on whether we are indeed satisfying all of the constraints of the original problem. And we're gonna train this, this model end to end. And when we're actually using the model, we kind of use this neural network plus this AC power flow solver plus this device limit correction. So we're actually using all of those components in real time to, to make sure that the output is satisfying constraints that we out. And um, uh, kind of for those who are very familiar with machine learning, this is actually a kind of what's called a self-supervised formulation of machine learning, which basically means I didn't have to generate labels or answers for what the answer should be based on already solving some other optimization, the problem using some other solver. Um, I'm allowing the machine learning model to have a way to self-determine whether its outputs are good which in an optimization setting is very uh, doable because an optimization problem has an objective function and constraints. So you can check, check is the objective good and are the constraints satisfied? And the upshot is that basically for, again, admittedly small prototype systems, but kind of in initial settings, um, when we compare this approach against sort of a standard neural network or a standard optimization solver, we find that kind of this approach satisfies all of the constraints of the optimization problem, unlike a kind of naive neural network. Um, it has a reasonably comparable objective value to kind of a real optimization solver. So even though we're not enforcing that the objective value must be good, we're learning that from data and practice, we're seeing that it's good. Um, and we're able to kind of improve the speed of solving the optimization problem by about 10 times. And the basic way that all of this is happening is like to the previous question, we do have this kind of more expensive power flow solver in the loop of our neural network approach. Even though it's more expensive than a standard neural network, it's less expensive than solving the entirety of the optimization problem that we're replacing. So we're again making some trade-offs about which components are very much worth preserving that even though they're a little bit expensive, we, we still want to keep them around and embed that in the neural network. And what are we not needing to exactly preserve? In this case, the fact that the solution is provably optimal, we're not preserving that at all. Uh, we're letting that be learned from data. In that case, that's a trade-off we're okay making that allows us to kind of not kind of uh, incur the full expense of the original. All right, so 
basically kind of a wrap on on that part the basic idea being that I, I think that there's a lot of really um powerful opportunities to kind of not view machine learning as a black box both in the context of power systems and more broadly but really allow ourselves to take existing knowledge constraints and so forth that we have and actually kind of design these these methods that that are learning from data but that inherently have components we can look at understand that are enforcing constraints we care about um and i think this yeah i think this has a lot of uh, uh, applicability to power systems and problems so yeah thanks so much thanks for for letting me go over for those who have to scurry away and for those who don't have to around and answer questions